Welcome along to another edition of Matchbooks Weekend Football Podcast. Guys have been in terrific form in the last couple of weeks. From this podcast, our best bets, 13 winners from the last 14 best bets section. Adrian Clark, last weekend, you get to wait a while. Middlesbrough and over one and a half, <laughs> 95th minute. Uh, you should have seen me because I was working at Molyneux um, for TalkSport. And um, so I was, I was hearing the, it was around the grounds and I was hearing the goals go in, in my ears before they come to reports with us. And um, I was fuming. I was like, you should, I, I slammed my desk. I was like, what, what are Reading doing winning this game? This can't this can't happen. But when, as soon as Barry got the equaliser, I think with 10 minutes left, I, I knew I was safe. I knew that Reading yeah. would collapse. I knew that Barry would go on and, and win the game. So, um, so, yeah, it turned out nice at the end. But I was sweating there. That, that was not as convincing as, as anticipated. Yeah, look, we, we, you know what, we probably deserve it. We've had a, we've had a couple of those go against us too. And it's a very warm benvenuto to Signor Marco here with another Italian pick made. Goals galore in Sassuolo, Sassuolo and uh, Empoli, wasn't it? So five goals. Oh, sorry, against Verona. Sassuolo and Verona, you went over 2.75 is your best bet. Five goals, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was... Uh... It was pretty much almost home and hose before half time because Verona absolutely wiped the floor with Sassuolo in the first half and because he easily have scored five or six goals themselves. Um, Sassuolo came out second half and put up a bit more of a fight, um, but that's been them all season really. They've been pretty laboured in home games, but uh, much more exciting and expansive and, and goal heavy away from home. So, uh, yeah, that's certainly a theme to be keeping an eye on going forward. Uh, you know what? Guess what? Another two winners on Matchbook Insights. That's 19 winners from his last 20 selections. Mark has filed his copy early, bright and early on Thursday morning. That's up on insights.matchbook.com. AC, you had a winning week as well on uh, Insights last weekend. Two out of three, I think. So, yeah, it was a uh, yeah, good, yeah, good comeback. It was my first yep. one of the year. I'd had a little bit of a break. So, yeah, that was, that was not too yep. bad at all. Trending very positively there as well. We also had a Premier League clean sweep last weekend. City Chelsea uh, under 2.75, obviously only one goal in that one. Newcastle Watford, both teams to score came up as well. And uh, Villa plus a quarter of a goal was a 50% win. So, well done, gentlemen. Very efficient Premier League markets, but you seem to be beating them. Well done. All right, first game we're going to talk about today is a West London versus a North London team. Chelsea play host to Tottenham Hotspur at the bridge. 1.71, you can back the Blues here. Tottenham a 5.4, the draw available a 4.1. Tottenham getting a three-quarter of a goal start on the main Asian handicap line, 2.0, it's even money. And two and a half is the total, slightly shaded towards the under. Mark, um, obviously, look, we're recording this on Thursday morning. Big win for Spurs. There's a bit more of a fight in the Spurs team, too. It's, it's kind of good to see it, isn't it, in comparison to previous months. But what about Chelsea again during the week? It's just like, come on, you need to be winning this game way at Brighton. In terms of the angle in here, though, I think you're expecting both teams to actually be able to get on the score sheet. Yeah, I do. I mean, there's a couple of angles I was considering. That's certainly the one which I've probably gone down towards as my, my official angle. But I I mean, I'll start with Chelsea because I, I think we're all, I don't know if I'm speaking for everyone, but certainly I am getting a bit more frustrated and tired of Thomas Tuchel's constant moans and complaints at the minute, talking about a heavy schedule with Chelsea and yeah, look, they've pretty much played every three to four days since November's international break, but they've got a squad which is more than co capable of, of coping with that kind of demand. They've got a raft of players out on loan that the sort of squad size, if all the contracted players at Chelsea were kind of available, would be probably in, in three figures, to be honest. So they're equipped for it. So is it deflection? Possibly they've only won once in seven in the Premier League, 12 points adrift of City, which is quite a drop off considering they're top of the table in December. Um, but the Malays has been there probably further on from that. They've only won four of the last 13 in the Premier League since October. And that famed defence, uh, which kind of kept them in games throughout his reign, has been creaking for some time. Just two clean sheets in those 13 games compared to just three goals conceded in their first 10 games. So I said last week they're not losing regularly. Uh, just two defeats in 25 now across all comps. I actually thought they were excellent in the first leg of the League Cup against Spurs. Wiped the floor with them, really. And I thought they were reasonable at City last week. Um, I think they had their chances. They played pretty sensibly, um, very similar to how they got the better of City last season. But Lukaku didn't have a great game. They were beaten by a cracking goal. City were the better team, but I think Chelsea's blueprint wasn't wasn't the worst. Um, 
you know, but something's not quite right about Chelsea at the moment. I can't put my finger on it, but sort of Mason Mount being left on the bench seems a bit strange to me. Um, and there definitely seems to be a degree of discontent around Tuchel at the moment. We know about the spat with Lukaku, but he just doesn't look a happy bunny at the moment. And, and sort of negatives, if, if you're looking for more, no Mendy, Chilwell, James, we talked about that last week. Three very influential players. Uh, I guess the real sort of Indian sign for Chelsea is the head-to-head -head record against Spurs, which is dominant. Um, yeah. Five wins from six unbeaten in the Premier League across all venues. One defeat in 31 Premier League games at Stamford Bridge. They've beaten Spurs three times already this season. They haven't conceded a goal in the last five head-to-head. -head. But I just think at the prices, there's not really a thirst for me to get Chelsea on side at 1.71. They were 1.85 uh, going into that League Cup tie at Stamford Bridge just <clears throat> weeks ago, which is a, a significant difference. I know it's a cup tie, um, but both teams are being very keen to win that match. Um, and Spurs are much, much better than what they served up in that tie. So um, I still think uh, they're probably not as far down the line as I would have hoped or possibly Conte would have hoped, Tottenham that is, um, at this stage. Mm -hmm. They have had a reasonable schedule. Um, you know, Liverpool at home was, was the hardest, really, before Leicester away, and Leicester missing pretty much all their defenders. Uh, Son's missing as well, but uh, I think we saw enough from Tottenham, particularly the character to come back in that match and, and the will to go and win that game in the final minute. Um, you know, that could always, either, easily go one of two ways. They could be, you know, struggle to get kind of get back down to earth for this match or it could use them as, as a massive motivational tool to kind of keep on building on that. But uh, obviously have the less rest coming into this match too. So I did find it difficult. I thought Spurs plus one on the Asian handicap at 173 was was a reasonable play. I was certainly been back in Chelsea at that, those prices, but mm. considering the, the defences at the minute, I, I just think probably back both teams to score at, at even money. I mean, that's a, that's a big price considering how both of these two teams have defended of late. Uh, you look at Spurs, the goals they gave away, the chances they gave away against Leicester midweek and Chelsea too. As I mentioned, those clean sheets, just two in 13 Premier League games now, which dates back to October. Yeah, Adrian, that, that price in Chelsea is rotten short. It's a 1.71 currently. That's... You couldn't be having that. You, you can't back Chelsea at that price. No no chance because the form isn't good, is it? I, I thought over the two legs against Spurs, they were actually pretty good. They were in control. Um, but they went with a back four, didn't they, in those games? Yeah. And I, I, I sense that that should be the way that Tuchel goes here. They just don't look right with a back three without James and Chilwell. It's just not the same. They, they don't yeah. have enough creativity and they're very reliant on, on those wing backs, as we know. And... You know, it, it, it puts a lot of onus on Lukaku to sort of fashion chances for himself. And he's not really playing well enough to, to do that at the moment. I'd echo pretty much everything what, what Mark said there. I, I, I found myself sort of nodding to, nodding along to everything. The only thing I can really add on, on, on Chelsea's side is their record against teams in the top nine this season is bang average. I, I mean, it, the, out of a possible 33 points against the teams currently sat in the, in the top nine. They've got 12. And, and the two wins came very early on in the season at Spurs and at Arsenal when they were absolutely flying. A lot of drawn games, some unexpected, some defeats as well chucked in there. Some mediocre performances as well. I mean, against everyone else in the league, they've only dropped four points all season. So, so it's against the best teams. They've not been as as dominant at all. Um, and, and, and going on to Tuchel, if you keep telling players they're knackered, they're, they'll feel knackered. It's, <laughs> honestly, it's, uh, I, I think it's for, for a smart guy, and I rate him, you know, I don't go back on, on saying that he's the real deal as a yeah, coach. Yeah. I think he's a very smart manager. Absolutely brilliant. But right now, I think his head's frazzled. I think he's a little bit all over the place. Spurs, I mean, awful record against Chelsea. Not a great record on the road. Um, obviously, a fantastic win in the end last night at Leicester. Um, but so that sort of puts me off of them. But they did look more. They did look a goal threat at Leicester. Now, whether that was down to Leicester being uh, awful, um, I know they're down to the bare bones. But but Spurs, whenever they went forward in the game against Leicester, they looked really, really menacing. And Chelsea's back back three, back five, back four, whatever it is, aren't in good shape at the moment. So, no, five blanks for Spurs against Chelsea. I just don't see that continuing. So sooner or later, they have to score a yeah. goal against Chelsea. I think now is the time for that. I think, I think they'll score. I certainly can't see Chelsea uh, not scoring against Spurs because I'm not convinced by their defence either. So, yeah, as soon as I saw this match, my, my eyes were drawn to both teams to score. And when I saw the price... I was like, yeah, all day long, that's for me. So um, in complete agreement with, um, with Mark on this one. Big price. 
even yeah, money for a, a game yeah, of yeah. such attacking yeah. quality on both teams. Yeah, I mean, it's two big guns and there's been a lot of matches in this fixture where BTTS know has landed. I think historically that probably lands more often. But use your eyes and look at the performances of both teams, particularly at the back of late and where they've been vulnerable. And you think, well, I don't, I don't see either of them keeping a clean sheet. So, yeah, I, th- I think, yeah, I think... I think we're onto something here, but we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, both teams score currently available one point nine nine. Just, just I just want to double back on something you said there regards Tuchel, Adrian. It's a point mm-hmm. one made because Chelsea and under three now we've made plenty of money off this last season, and obviously mm-hmm. you know my opinions with my remember that anti post selection sixteen one with Chelsea had yeah, that one. Uh, but like we know that Tuchel's going to, but I wonder. And this is possibly narrative laden, right? But you see him at Dortmund, year two, year three, just started to bloody upset the whole building. Mm. Kind of similar, obviously, with PSG. You know, you maybe give him a pass there because that whole kind of organization is probably mm. pretty dysfunctional. But you just mm. kind of wonder if it does happen with some managers, they kind of just have that one or year two year bones, and then it gets to year three, and you're like, oh, shit, what, what, what do we do next? Yeah, it, I feel for him in a way because he's been dealt some quite bad cards. Lukaku stitched him up with that interview, so it caused a situation yeah. that he wasn't expecting. I actually th- felt he dealt with that really, really well. Um, the injuries to key players at the same time hasn't helped, and and I just think, I just think he's got the massive hump that everyone else is getting their games called off, and he isn't. <laughs> I just think it might just boil down to that, and 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 he's just thinking this is not yeah. fair. My players are knackered; no one else's are. And yeah, so in fairness, I think if you look at the the top coaches in the league as well, they're all bad losers. They're they're yeah, all yeah. the dummy goes out whenever they don't get a result they want. Yeah, you know, yeah. Pep, Klopp, yeah, yeah, Tuchel, yeah, they're all the same in that sense. That the mm. I guess it's the, the the winning habit they have in their heads. But whenever it goes awry, they they just lose the plot a little bit. <laughs> Bunch of babies. All right, Man United <laughs> West Ham. Both teams to score as a selection there. One point nine nine. Manchester United West Ham is the next game we're looking at here, gentlemen. Um, you know, obviously fresh from that win at Brentford. I don't know what you can read into that. I think that score is slightly misleading, but we will chat about that in a second. 1.94 here. You come back United at home. Not a great home record, obviously, the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months. Uh, West Ham at 4.2. The draw available at 3.8. West Ham getting a half a goal start in the main Asian handicap line at 1.98. Obviously, if it's a draw as well, your bet wins on that one. And two and three quarters is the goal angle. Right, Adrian? I kind of touched on there. Pick it up. But like, I mean... Are you going to read too much into the Wednesday night's performance of Brentford? I think the score is slightly misleading. Obviously, Brentford didn't help themselves. But there's still a lot of question marks over this United team. Loads of question marks, but but they got a good result, didn't they? In the end, David De Gea was in spectacular yeah. form. Uh, they've relied so much on him, haven't they? Uh, that Yeah, the defence doesn't look look great. I mean, obviously, Dallo and, and Tellez probably aren't first choice. Um, but it's not just about that. I just think as a team, they, they're not defending brilliantly. I think Rang- Rangnick has given up on, on trying to implement his own ideas and he's just roll- he's just rolling with what the players want now, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Just in the hope yeah. of, of sort of um, nicking some results here and there. I think that was, that was a terrific result. Obviously, Rashford and Greenwood scoring gives them a lift as well. Coming into, coming into the weekend, um, I, th- I think this is a really difficult game to call. Um, I know that you love a, a random stat, so I'm going to chuck another one at, oh, yeah. at you. Love you love these around kickoff times, don't you? So, um, United, <laughs> at 3 p.m. on a Saturday, they don't oh, like geez. it, boys. They do not like it. They lost 4 2 at Leicester and 4 1 against Watford in their last two 3 p.m. Saturday kickoffs. So, look, they get, they're going to get. They're going to lose a few goals in this game. Clearly. I'm a bit surprised. Sir. I thought you were going to put like at 3 p.m. on a Saturday when the temperature is under 12 and a half degrees. <laughs> the the no, it's turned. The temperature's turned, doesn't it? So I can't chuck that into the mix. But yeah. um, So United are hard to pick, aren't they? I think, to be honest, I think the Rashford and Greenwood goals, Ronaldo coming off, I actually see that as a positive. Yeah. I think he'll be really fired up to, to score. So I, I think West Ham can, uh, Man United can score, score goals in the game. Um, not least because West Ham aren't, Defending very well at all. I mean, yeah, I think four they were wide open the last couple of games in the yeah. leagues. They were just like, I mean, four of their last five games, West Ham have had five goals in it. I mean, yeah. they've scoring goals, they've been conceding goals. Their away records not that stellar this season. They lost quite comfortably, didn't they? At Arsenal, City, they lost Wolves. I don't think they've beaten anyone away from home in the top half yet, uh, West Ham this season, despite having a having a cracking campaign. So. I don't, and they have a terrible record at Old Trafford. So I, I don't really fancy West Ham here. Um, but 
But do I fancy them to maybe nick a goal? Of course I do, because you've got Bowen, who's one of the most informed players in, in the division, and and others around them. You know, Lanzini's you know playing all right, and and um, for now, and and Antonio's not in great nick, but he's always he's always worth a goal, isn't he? See, I, I found this a really difficult game to 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 pick a, a result in. I lean towards United. It's goals. I, I just feel on in this on this particular occasion because both teams are giving up so many chances. And because both teams have got players that, that can clearly do damage inside the final third. Yeah, I, I kind of see both teams scoring. I kind of see see United winning a, a, a game with goals. So, so I've landed on just, just a straight over, over 2.5 rather than 2.75. Um, obviously, it's a lower price, 1.76 at the moment, but... That's how I see it. I think um, I think we'll see uh, we'll see the net bulge a few times here. And Mark, what what do you make of this one? I kind of get the sense, even in terms of just the matchups here, I think at least with West Ham, they know what they are, and that's probably you know it's a big advantage sometimes for a team. Whereas United, obviously, like Age and Dutch, it there, there's still potentially an identity crisis there for them. Yeah, there is, and the market thinks so as well. Um, there's not really a huge amount of faith yeah. in United. This mm. is the biggest price they'll ever be at home to right. West Ham in the Premier League. They were 1.8 when hosting the Hammers last March last year. That was without fans at Old Trafford. Obviously, we've got a full stadium this weekend, and they're trading not far off even money, which is saying something, yeah. whereas mm. traditionally they'd be 1.4 or, or below in this match. So, um, you know, but two teams going in different directions, you could say. Uh, I've no real desire to get United on side, even at that price, no. personally. Um, I know the majority of the squad is, is fit and available. Uh, Rangnick said the first half hour against West Aston Villa was, was probably the best they've played under him. They were all right in spells, for sure. Uh, they did play pretty well, but didn't create a huge amount in the final third. Uh, the two goals they got were, were arguably gifted to them, particularly the first. Uh, Fernandes looked a lot better without Ronaldo. So, you know, with Ronaldo back in the team, uh, it's another shift in system. But... Yeah, ultimately, I just think they look disjointed, disinterested, yeah. fragmented. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, look at the first half against Brentford. David De Gea, man of the match yet again, uh, which is saying something. They're giving away far too many opportunities. And I think if you looked at this match from a purely expected goals uh, perspective, uh, West Ham should be a, a lot shorter than what they are. United are being sort of given a, a great amount of faith by the market because of the name and because of the players that are available to them. But expected points, expected goals, performance data all say West Ham are the better team. They also have the rest advantage. United turning around from Wednesday to Saturday, which is reasonably tough. But uh, yeah, I mean, as you guys have talked about, West Ham are hard to sort of back with confidence at the moment, yeah. considering how they're defending. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think Thomas Tuchek is due back this weekend for the Hammers, and I think that'll be a massive bonus for them because Declan Rice, as good as he is, does try to do a bit too much when he's kind of handed the midfield role on his own without yeah. Suchek, and I think that balance is key. So uh, I think West Ham can be definitely be competitive here. Um, but yeah, goals were immediately what I wanted to back here. BTTS was 1.7. It's been shortened in. Uh, so uh, yeah, next best is, is over two and a half goals. Uh, the one negative I found about this, though, surprisingly, United have only scored eight home Premier League goals in their last eight games. Uh, so they started the season by scoring nine goals in the first two at Old Trafford against Leeds mm. and Newcastle. Just eight home goals since then, which is mm. pretty poor. But also surprisingly, mm. they've only kept four clean sheets all season in the Premier League. Four and mm. 21, which is staggeringly bad for a team chasing top yeah. four. And similarly, West Ham, just five clean sheets themselves, four of which came against the bottom half. The one clean sheet against the top half was against a, a Spurs team coached by Nuno, which is probably saying something. So um, West Ham's games mm. featured the second highest goals so far in the Premier League, 71. Uh, BTTS copying in 60-80% of those as well. So expect both teams to score and with that in mind, you kind of back over to enough goals as well. Yeah, because a short enough price is probably the minimum one we would ever put up on the podcast, 1.7, mm -hmm. but it's uh, hard to disagree with that one. Again, probably won't be our biggest bet of the weekend by any means, but if you are looking for an angle here, generally the goals one is the one to be on. All right, guys, next game I want to talk about Leeds against Newcastle. Um, Obviously, Leeds, we touched on there earlier, big win against West Ham last week. Uh, 2.04. You can back uh, Bielsa's side here. Newcastle, 3.85. The draw available at 3.85. Newcastle getting a half a goal starting the main agent handicap line at matchbook.com. As I said, I'll keep the draw on site, and that's currently a 1.93. 2.5 is the total. Mark, uh, this is your game of choice here, and you fancy Leeds to get the job done. Yeah, um, I think they're being slightly undervalued by the market, um, probably due to the number of players that are missing from the squad through injury. But I thought they were terrific against Burnley when winning at Ellen Road 
not so long ago, and I thought they were thoroughly deserving of their win at West Ham last week. Father defending from set pieces, which has been a problem all season, they were they were superb. Really, consider the circumstances down to the bare bones with kids on the bench, lose two of your senior players in the first half, and you barely notice the difference when the two youngsters come in and and slot into that team. I think it's just testament to, to Marcelo Bielsa's work there. And, you know, it's not hipster or anything. I, I still don't think he gets enough credit for what he's achieved at that club. A remarkable turnaround considering where Leeds were before him, uh, considering the players he inherited, uh, how how those players have improved and collectively the club has just improved and kind of continued to, to progress. Uh, we talk about Newcastle having a, a sort of championship standard squad bar a few exceptions. Well, the same is, is with Leeds, but you can see the progress Leeds mm-hmm. make and, you know, word is for Adam Forshaw should be fit for this, despite going off last week. Uh, Bamford should be available now. He was touch and go last week. Diego Lorente returns from a ban. So uh, team news is, is better than probably expected. Uh, but Bielsa normally is very, very revealing at his press conferences. So it's probably worth just waiting uh, waiting to hear what he says, because he will tell you who's fit and who's not, who's available and who's not. He's normally very good like that. So, yeah, I mean, um, I like Leeds. They tend to deliver against the, the lesser teams. You look at their yeah. record this season. Four wins, seven draws, just one defeat against teams in eighth and below. Three wins, two draws, zero defeats against the bottom half. Strong figures. I know a lot of that would be produced with a stronger squad, but even still, um, I, I just fancy them to get the better of Newcastle because Newcastle, how many chances do you need to really to, to start getting a, a run of results together? I mean, it was one-way traffic against uh, Watford last weekend. They got the goal and then just took the foot off the pedal. Still just one Premier League win all season. Fans are starting to lose a little bit of faith now. Um, played obviously Burnley and Norwich as well recently, scored just three goals in those three games uh, against their sort of bottom three rivals. Just the one clean sheet all season, a lack of reinforcements yet to sort of arrive in key defensive and midfield areas, which I think everyone could see they needed from day one, let alone in January. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm just happy to oppose Newcastle. They've scored six goals away from home all season. 70% of their goal tally has come yeah. at St. James's Park. Uh, if you look at XG numbers, they're right down there away from home with the with Burnley and Norwich as well in terms of what they're creating. Um, I just don't like them, to be honest. Um, <laughs> and I think uh, I think Leeds are well, more than capable of, of winning this match. Um, I give them a, a much stronger chance than what the market is saying, which is less than 50% chance to win this game. So um, ideally, uh, I would have backed Leeds minus a quarter, but um, I think that's trading just below 1.75 now. I probably want more, more than that really to sort of hang your hat on. So I think Leeds to win the game is, is fair enough for odds against. Adrian Clark, some positive body language there, mate. I don't think there's any disagreement on this one. No, I'm not much to disagree with, no. Um, I mean, in fairness to Newcastle, they've scored in 15 of 20 games. So there's only five five blobs there for them across the season so far. So even though they're not expected to score that many, they often nick one. Um, they often scored a first goal, interestingly. I think they've, they've taken the lead in 10 matches this season and gone on to win, obviously, just, just one of them. That's shocking. It's shocking game management. And, and and if they take the lead at Ellen Road, I'd still fancy Leeds. <laughs> I really would <clears throat> to come back and and win the game. They're better now. You can see it. Just if you just look look at them. If you blur your eyes and you see the white shirts buzzing around on the screen, <laughs> they're moving faster. They're getting into the box more often. They're flooding the box like like the Leeds used to. That there was a spell in there where, where they just weren't Bielsa's Leeds. But I just get the feeling that they're back. Forty shots across those two wins against Burnley and West Ham. That, that, that's no mean feat. So, yeah, they've got their energy back, which is great. Um, 100% fancy Leeds because I think they're a better team and they're at home and they do have a good record as being the flat track bully as well. Um, what I to, to boost the odds, and you don't need to boost the odds because I think Leeds are, are a good price anyway on the nose. If you fancied uh, goals because of Newcastle's penchant for the odd goal, because Leeds can't defend, because they're, 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 they're firing off so many shots. Leeds and over 1.5 goals, so you know, effectively taking them to win the game anything but 1-0, is 2.42. So you can just push the odds the odds up there. And, and I looked at average goals in, in matches, both exactly the same. Leeds matches average 3.15 goals a game. Same for Newcastle. So the averages tell you there'll be more and 1.5 goals here. And if you fancy Leeds, that, that might be a nice little little pairing. 
yeah, absolutely. We can boost the price up there, but uh, I think obviously if this is game, Mark's game of choice. We'll just take the small bit more security, uh, two point zero four, just in case there's a one that leads win. We'll be kicking ourselves then, AC. But exactly. you know what? I'm going to see to you for the next game because this is your game of choice. So whatever you say here, mate, we're going with no <laughs> matter what. Oh, okay. This is, uh, this is, I think I, I think me and Mark are in different camps. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, but I'm gonna, I, I have to back you know, don't they? I can't go the other way. It's, so. it's not an easy game. I didn't I didn't pick oh. this because I think I thought it would would be an easy game to 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 call I, I just like the look of the game i think it's a, it's a potentially interesting one um we, be, we better break the suspense because if you're listening to the podcast you have no idea what game we're talking about <laughs> it's crystal it's palace, palace v liverpool yeah there you go palace against liverpool the odds, just, just before i come back to you in a second adrian palace you come back mm-hmm. at 6.2 Big price at home, obviously, but look, they're playing Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool just under 1.6 and 1.59. The draw available of 4.2. Palace getting a full goal start on the main Asian handicap line at 1.87. And that eventuality, if Palace do lose by a goal, you get your goal, uh, money back. And 2.75 is the total. Slightly shaded towards the over. All right, Adrian, I touched on it there. Palace plus one. Mm. Make the case why well, you think that's a solid bet. No, not for me. No, no. <laughs> what did I say that? I was like, read my notes wrong, upside down. You actually like Liverpool in this one, and all. I do. Now. Yeah. No, for me, it's Liverpool, but it's it's not easy. Liverpool's away yeah. form is good over the, over the course of the season. I know that they're missing Salah and Mane, but but we've seen signs from Minamino um, that he can contribute. Firmino too in the cups. Shota, we know, is a, is a class act. A few goals from midfield as well. Van Dijk is back. I think that's that's absolutely huge. Alexander Arnold and Robertson in very good form now. You know they've had dips at various stages, haven't they? But they they're really sharp. Obviously, we don't know what's going to happen tonight. I'm off down to Emirates for that one. Can't wait. Um, so so you know I could be made to look silly here, but but yeah, I, I feel like Liverpool are, are starting to find a little bit of form. Obviously, they dispatched Brentford quite easily. Something yeah. Manchester United made look look a lot tougher, didn't they? Um, so yeah, for Liverpool, for Liverpool, I mean, a lot of goals normally in Liverpool. Liverpool games, I think, sixteen of twenty-one have gone over over two and a half. Um, Palace games, thirteen of twenty-one have gone over two and a half. So, so the pattern suggests we, we could see goals here, even though they're missing some of those some of those big guns. Liverpool love it at Selhurst Park. Um, last six Premier League away games there, they've scored nineteen goals, including, of course, seven nil. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, it's, it's Palace are a good team. Palace are, Palace are fine. I thought that they were maybe a little bit lucky to get to get away with a draw at, at Brighton. They gifted up a lot of chances. I think if you're going to play Michael Elise and Eze, which they did, it's good for going forward. It's not so good when you have to go the other way. And thinking about Robertson, thinking about Arnold, I can absolutely see see those two um, pushing those two guys back and maybe causing. Causing a few problems, and Palace as well have a huge weakness at set pieces. I mean, you know this. I mean, they've conceded, I think, eleven set piece goals. They're right up there. I think they might be the most in the Premier League in terms of set piece concessions. And for me, Liverpool are excellent from corners, particularly when Van Dijk is playing. So, so yeah, Liverpool are the stronger team. I would fancy them to win, um, not not handsomely, but but I fancy them to win. Um, so Liverpool and over 1.5 goals. I've been banging on about goals. So Liverpool and over 1.5 just stretches the odds to 1.89. And, and for me, that that is the best selection. But but I would understand why people might want to oppose Liverpool because they've not been, you know, smashing teams and they are missing a few. But in my opinion, they are significantly better team than Crystal Palace. And I expect them to win this game. All right, Mark, sorry, I got it wrong leading off. So you make the case here for Palace plus the goal. Yeah, it, it's a tricky game. Um, yeah. There's a lot of question marks over this match, over mm. you know the influence of, of Salah and Mane, for example, and, and how Liverpool will cope without them. But I, I just came to the conclusion that this is one of the rare opportunities we might get to side of an underdog. It feels like a tricky game on paper. I know Liverpool have a tremendous record in this head-to-head fixture, but... Um, obviously, playing Thursday night is your starting point. That's that's already an inconvenience for Liverpool. Yeah. It's a big game that have to go to the Emirates and win. Um, so Palace have a, a free midweek, but just labour the, the sort of Salah and Mane points. It's been done to death, I'm sure, elsewhere the last couple of weeks or, or since the African Cup of Nations came into sort of vision for people last year. But just a few points to kind of summarise how influential they have been. They've scored 46% of Liverpool's total goals 
across the Premier League and the Champions League. They've scored 33 goals between them in those two competitions and they've assisted 10 more combined as well, comfortably mm -hmm. exceeding both XG and expected assists as well. In the Premier League alone, they've scored 55 goals to Liverpool. Salah, Mane and even Naby Keita have contributed, either scored or assisted 32 of those. That's 58%. Obviously, all three missing this weekend. I think last weekend against Brentford was the first time Salah or Mane didn't start a Premier League game for Liverpool since May 2017. So they're not accustomed to playing without both of them, let alone one of them. So, um, yeah, I mean, away from home, six wins from 11 for Liverpool. But they have conceded in five of the last six, which puts extra pressure on an attack, which I thought looked relatively blunt against Arsenal in the first leg of the League Cup. Took time to break Brentford's resistance as well last week. And now we've got an injury to Oxley chamberlain as well. Origi's out as well. So they're a little bit light up top. I know midfield and defence is pretty much as you expect. But yeah, Palace, I don't get Palace right too often this season. So it's fair to say I'm not coming in this with, with major confidence. But they're getting loads of plaudits for doing things in the right way. But in terms of points accrued, they're pretty much on the same level as they did at this stage last season under Hodgson. Obviously, the football's more progressive, enjoyable. The goal last week against Brighton was was wonderful. They are on an upward trajectory. They will get better. There's plenty of youngsters with room for improvement. But they have only won five Premier League games under Patrick Vieira. To put that figure in context, Watford have won four. So, you know, that's that's a that's something they need to improve upon. But uh, they're obviously, I'm not backing to beat Liverpool. I'm just backing them to be competitive in this match, which I think they can be with the full Southhurst Park behind them. You know, raucous crowd, Liverpool possibly a little bit jaded, missing their key forwards. So, you know, I need Liverpool to win this game by two goals or more to lose my stake. And I think that's that's a reasonable angle to take. But um, the secondary angle would have been just uh, plain goals. I think over two and a half goals, if you can get 175, I think is fair enough. I do fancy Palace to get on the score sheet. And if they do score, obviously Liverpool need three to see my bet lose, which mm. without Sadar or Mane, I'm quite happy to kind of get involved with. Yeah. Just one clean sheet in 10 for Palace. So they're not they're not defending, you know, with any great sort of security. Um, but no, yeah, that, Mark makes, good, makes a good case, to be fair. Not, not good enough for case though, so we're sticking with Jordan. <laughs> yes. well, it's, it's Liverpool. It's Liverpool, yeah. and no matter what team they put out, I, I would always fancy them to beat Crystal Palace. I'm sorry, yeah. And, and, and yeah, so I, I'm not deterred enough, I guess, by the the yeah, absence of those good. those big guns. So we'll, we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> absolutely will. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Liverpool over one and a half because it's Adrian's game of choice or selection of 1.89. Let's do a quick... No problem, mate. You were due. <laughs> uh, I probably screwed you over once or twice before, so I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> uh, recap of what we have so far before we get the EFL European best bets. Chelsea, Tottenham, both teams score 1.99. We have over two and a half at Old Trafford for Manchester United and West Ham. That's a 1.7 short price, but we reckon a good bet nonetheless. Leeds at 2.04, and we just touched on it there. Liverpool and over one and a half at 1.89. If you want to get involved in those bets and the other bets later on, that podcast double last week came up as well, guys. 3.0. Great stuff. 20-point uh, welcome offer available at matchbook.com. Use the bonus code Insights RF. When signing up, that's Insights RF for a £20 welcome bonus. Full terms conditions can be found at insights.matchbook.com, as will be a full recap of the lad selections, insights.matchbook.com. Agent Clark, League One, Sunderland, and under three and a half versus Portsmouth. Mm. Um, Sunderland, highest scoring team in the league. Mm. Um, so I can kind of probably see the angle here, but I was kind of looking this morning. I was surprised to see actually Pompey, although they're kind of like, you know, towards the kind of the bottom half of the table, defensively quite good. Oh, they're defensively excellent. Um, yeah. I, I saw them in the flesh in, in midweek. I went to AFC Wimbledon v Portsmouth. So I got, got a good steer on Pompey. And, and they are solid at the back. Uh, they weren't up against too much in, in AFC Wimbledon. But in general, that that is not an issue for, for Pompey this season. Scoring goals is and, and creating chances. They, they're not fluent. They've got a couple of low knees there. Uh, Tyler Walker's just joined. They're sort of getting to know each other. And I was really unimpressed, actually, with, with Portsmouth. I, I, I thought that they they would be much better than they were against a pretty weak AFC Wimbledon. So I was put off of Portsmouth. Um, their, their games only average 2.12, um, which is the joint lowest in, in League One. So, so yeah, I, that's where I'm coming at with the, with the goal side of it. I was put off by, the, by Portsmouth's quality. Sunderland have only failed to score in four of, four of 27 games this season. They're a really good attack inside, as you rightly pointed out. Lee Johnson would always go out to try and win games, score goals. They've got some really informed players. Obviously, Ross Stewart is, is in terrific nick at the moment up top, but he's not the only one. They've got other players too. 
Um, and and in terms of of dropping points um, against the, the 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 better teams in the division at home, so at the Stadium of Light, play, when they've played against teams in the top fourteen. Eight time, eight matches they've had. They've only dropped two points. They've been really, really professional and solid and successful in the in the so called tougher matches at the Stadium of Light. So yeah, Sunderland to win, but it not to be a high scoring game uh, is my shout. Sunderland at under three point five. I think the price is quite nice. Um, you know, obviously it's a small play yeah. at two point six four, but but I could I could see a, a low scoring win for them. And on to League Two, you're looking at the second place team, Tranmere here. Interesting team. Um, second in the table, 27 <laughs> goals in 25 games. So obviously, it's yeah. defense again for them. And it would have drawn no bet market. Obviously, it keeps that on site if it's just a nil or if it's a one nil scrap, you win. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like, when I saw that draw no bet was available at a decent enough price, I, I, could, I couldn't really walk away from it. Um, they're unbeaten in nine. Um, the top of the form table, if you look across the last eight games, uh, seven wins and a draw. So they're in they're in really, really good good nick at the moment. And they're scoring more goals than they were. So earlier on in the season, they, they were winning 1-0, 0-0, 1-0. It was very boring. They, they're getting better at, at, at the scoring part. They're still very solid. Only 15 conceded all season. Um, and Crawley, I mean, a very up and down side Crawley. Um, but only two points for a possible 18 at home. To teams residing in the top nine. So again, when when the best teams come to to Crawley Town, they they they've been coming up short, um, and and they're facing the form team in the division here, and um, that that are solid at the back, and they and they're starting to score goals. So for me, I would I I, I would be happy to back Tranmere to win the game, but when you get the assurance of the draw, no bet, you know, get your money back if they draw. That's that that's the one for me. Mark, go here to Europe. Um, we <laughs> promised there's an Italian bet coming, but we're not going to go there just yet. We are going to go for the best bet section. We're going to the Bundesliga. Leipzig and over one and a half versus Wolfsburg. Now, obviously, we posed Leipzig many times early on the season under the Jesse Marsh regime. Then um, Tedesco comes in, he gets a tune. But talk to me about Wolfsburg for a second, because obviously, look, Florian Kofeld came in there a couple of months ago. I don't know what the buzz is about this guy. He gets Bremen and relegated, almost gets relegated the year before. Then he comes in and they've one win in eleven. Last one against Paderborn. Why does this? Is he still in the job by the way? Because I haven't actually checked this, but he shouldn't be. Like, <laughs> so I, I read this somewhere. I, I think uh, Honigstein, Ralph Honigstein, wrote about it in the Athletic that there's some sort of German academy for coaches, and apparently he graded really well. And for some bloody reason. Because it's like um, he he's a high IQ. He gets really good jobs. I can't. I don't know why. Sorry, I'm on a bit of a rant here, but uh, yeah, look, we oppose them in the Champions League too, Mark. They're a good, they're a good fade. Yeah, they're. Um, I can't put my finger on it with Kofeld as well. I'm the same as you, Sally. You read a lot about how his reputation is sky high in Germany, and people are just waiting for him to sort of be this coaching genius. But results just don't seem to be matching the, the potential, really. And Wolfsburg are walk, sleepwalking their way into a relegation battle. It's it's quite frightening actually when you look at the league table. Yeah. They're now only three points off the automatic relegation berths. Only Champions League team last year. <laughs> yeah, and how good were they last season? They were just yeah. a, a machine, really. This is absolutely nothing like it this time around. Two wins, three draws, ten defeats since mid September. So this issue has been around for a while domestically as well as in Europe. Uh, since November's international break, they've taken just two points from a possible twenty-four. Um, two draws and six defeats. They failed to score in five of the last six. They're the second lowest goal scorers in the division anyway, and they've lost five or six away when you, when you exclude sort of the bottom six in the division. So the elite teams really. So yeah, I mean this play is is just as much about Wolfsburg being pretty dreadful at the moment, and Leipzig <laughs> kind of starting to find their groove a little yeah. bit. It's been an interesting campaign for them. Um, performance data always suggested they were much better than they were under Jesse Marsh, but obviously with your eyes they weren't anywhere near as dominant as. Julian Nagelsmann's team was worse. So, yeah, it's taken a while for them to get their mojo back. Uh, Variants possibly sort of doing them a bit of favour recently, but Domenico Tedesco was a surprise choice, uh, but he seems to get them moving in the right direction. Played a quite a strong team in the Pokal midweek when they beat uh, lower league Hansa Rostock. Um, Christoph Nkuku continues to sort of be superb for them this season. Uh, they won away at Stuttgart very comfortably <laughs> last weekend. And at home, they do tend to do the business. Seven wins from 10. Two of the defeats came against Bayern and Leverkusen. Six wins from seven 
at home against teams from 10th and below. And they've scored three goals or more in six of those wins. Or sorry, all six of those wins, uh, including a, a 4-1 thrashing of Mainz last weekend, which is no mean feat, really. Mainz are a difficult team to oust. And uh, yeah, 25 goals in those seven games against the teams below 10th which is really quite something. So uh, I don't expect them to, to win just 1-0 in this match. And if, uh, you know, as Adrian's done it elsewhere in the show, uh, back Leipzig to win, but just to uh, cover that sort of by any other scoreline bar 1-0, I think you get a nice boost from around 1.5 to about 1.8. Yep, like this bet, already touched on one play, Mark. Uh, good case there. Just stay with you for a second. So I'll bring us to Italy. Uh, Lazio, Atlanta, this is going to be a good game at the weekend. This is potentially a cracker. 2.75 is the goal line. Mark, why isn't this kind of higher? Why isn't this like, you know, three at one point and even the main line being three and a half? I can't really understand why. The only explanation I can come up with consistently for why Italy and Syria continues to kind of have lower goal lines than we expect and lower goal lines than what the actual goal output has been is purely because performance data drives these markets so strongly these days. And uh, I did a, an analysis piece for for a friend over the Christmas period, uh, which does everything from sort of tracks goals per game based uh, against expected goals. And there is a, a significant difference between the two. So basically goals are being converted at a much higher rate in Italy than you probably would expect to, which is probably why the market is kind of undervaluing them each week. But this has been a case... Bad keepers, last... Mark. Is it bad keepers? <laughs> What's going it, could, on? it could well be. Uh, there's been, a, you know, plenty of long range efforts as well going in. But... Uh, he wanted it's to make reference to Chesney there. I know he's. I know he's. <laughs> there. No, <I'm> not. <laughs> it's, it's it's difficult to really sort of drill down and say this is the reason for it. But that's the, that's personally the only explanation I can find to find the, the undervaluing. But but yeah, I mean this is game of the weekend for me. Um, Milan versus Juve has been given the, the prime time slot on Sunday night. But I think Saturday night's game at, at the yeah. Olympico should be. Superb, really, two coaches in, in Sari and Gasparini who will look to, to get goals and look to get their teams to, to win this match. Lazio have been superb in Rome, uh, not so good on the road, but they've scored three times or more, seven occasions at home this season. They're averaged just below three goals per game at home. They are the only team to beat Inter that came in Rome as well. Um, and At- Atalanta has just been outrageous on the road. Uh, they've yeah. dropped just two uh, points in two games uh, from 11 away from home. They've got the best points per game record away from home in Europe's major leagues. They scored twice or more in eight of those 11, average 2.36 goals per game away from home. Their match last weekend against Inter was, was really disappointing. There were plenty of chances, but the game ended nil-nil. I think Inter went there to Bergamo with a, with a you know, to do a job, basically, to, to nullify Atalanta and try and just avoid defeat to, to keep their buffer at the top end of the table. So I wouldn't read too much into that. Instead, just focus on the, the goal figures, really. So if you combine the two teams... Home and away records this season. Overs has hit in 16 of 21, over three and a half and 12 of those 21. BTTS in 15 of those 21. And then those 21 games averaged 3.88 goals per game. Uh, Atalanta seen overs land in 10 of their 12 against the top 12. Uh, and across the whole season, these two teams have scored in 36 of 43. Uh, and both teams scoring records pretty much around the 70% hit rate. So, yeah, I mean, everything's sort of uh, on the table here to be a a fantastic game. So watch it be nil-nil again. (laughs) (laughs) Adrian Clark, Manchester City are 1.3 away at St. Mary's the weekend. Uh, But you found uh, a better combination, City to win and over two and a half. So I think it's about 1.76 currently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, overwhelming favourites. I mean, I think Southampton are, are 12, priced up at 12, aren't they? They're at home. So, that, you know, it tells you that that, that almost everybody w- would expect Manchester City to win the game. I, I saw Southampton in the flesh at, at the weekend at Wolves. I mean, no one lets in three against Wolves, do they? Um, so, if you let in three against Wolves... Then, no one concedes um, to Conor Coley and the Dalma Traore either. Yeah, exactly. So, what was going to happen when they play City? I mean, they, in fairness, they weren't that bad. I, I, I thought the result was a little bit harsh on them. But the bottom line is, there's, there's no, no clean sheets in 10 for Southampton yeah. in the Premier League un, under Hasselhutl. And during that run, they've conceded, on average, I think, 2.1 goals per game. And that's, you know, the fixture list hasn't featured teams like Manchester City every week. So you would have to, you'd have to expect Pep Guardiola's men to go there and open them up on, on occasion. Um, yeah. Can, can Southampton lay a glove on them? I'm not sure. I mean, they've got good forward players. They might be able to nick a goal, but, but not more than one. I mean, City are just in imperious form, aren't they? Absolutely sensational. Kind of held off Chelsea, with, with relative ease, didn't they? I know it was a great goal to to win the game, but but yeah, I, 
City were were superior, and 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 yeah, Southampton. I, I feel will will give them chances. So yeah, best way in here, Manchester City, and over two point five goals. I think this has landed in in four of City's last five away games. Previously, and I remember Mark talking about it a lot. They were a bit of a one nil, two nil type team away from home. Um, in recent recent weeks, as I say, four four of the last five away games they've they've won, and over two point five goals has has come in as well. So. That's where I'm heading for, for my best bet this week. Yeah, like the angle. Uh, question from Shane. Or Shane, no respect, man. I'm actually kind of under pressure for time. He asked, can Mark or Adrian for New Year's predictions, Champions League winner, World Cup winner, oh. FA Cup, Europa League winner, Premier League oh player of the year? I have oh PFA award. Come on, Shane. Come Should on. we say that one? one at a time, yeah. <laughs> we, will come back, we will come back to what we're slightly over time, Shane. Apologies for that, mate. Uh, but we'll tr- we'll chance it again at some other stage. Yeah. And um, just in terms, we did that double last week. I was touching it there earlier, and we kind of enhanced it up to about three point zero. I think we'll get three point zero for this one. So I'm going to put over two and a half for Mark's bet, and I'm obviously going to just put Adrian's one in there. At two point uh, City winning over two point five. I think we'll get about three point zero. If you want to check those out, podcast specials on the Matchbook.com homepage. And FYI, the same double last week with the guys' best bets was three point zero. It was still up to about quarter past two on Saturday. And the world's biggest sports book, you know, Ray Winston's favorite sports book, they were 2.35. So that will give you an idea. There's plenty of value to be had if you want to get involved. So no pressure, gents. Um, <laughs> three points that we should be able to get there as well. My well, thanks, Adrian. My well, thanks to Mark. Good shows, ever, guys. Great stuff. Um, I think we're off for a few weeks. So there's international break, there's FA Cup. So, uh, but uh, insights.matchbook.com, if we have an off week and there's European EFL action, guys will have their content there. All right, guys, until a few weeks' time, best of luck, and uh, we'll chat to you soon. Bye for now.